Now, gracious peace to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, sometimes I run across folks and say, How can you believe the Bible? I mean, it's just a bunch of old stories from <clears throat> old people. It, it's not that real things. And then I say, Well, look at this, what we read today. Now, if anything sounds like what people are, it's what we read today. Jesus, having been in the tired side last week and through the Decapolis and going back through Galilee, and he's trying to teach his disciples what's going to happen. That he's going to be betrayed to men, that he's going to be hauled off in front of a kangaroo court, he's going to be brought before Pilate and condemned to death, he's going to be on a cross and he's going to die and he's going to be buried. And on the third day, he will rise again, and the disciples are going, what? I mean, really, it's, it's like the twelve, the three stooges times four. They just don't get it. And so while they're on the road, and they're in their little group, you know, men do it just as much as women do. You know, get together and talk a little bit. Are they talking about what Jesus is trying to teach them? No! They're all going, I'm number one. Mind you, football season around here, doesn't it? Where it's so important for my team to be number one. And I hate to tell you this, but my team ain't number one. <laughs> it's number zero right now. They haven't won a game yet. And I'm thinking that the third coach we've got since we the last year left, maybe get gone after this season. <laughs> but you know, it's just like what we are. We, you know, we get in a group of people, and we may like them, but we still compete. We all kind of have this thing inside of us. I am the best. You know, a, I hate to say this, but it sounds terrible, terrible, terrible. But there's a little rip failure in all our souls. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I have never put on a bathroom to sleep with you. <laughs> and I don't go around going, woo! <laughs> but I sometimes think I'm in bed. Y'all been watching wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus' disciples are essentially saying, when he comes in and is in charge, I'm going to be his right-hand man. I'm going to be the one that he looks to and gives the most favor. And they all feel that way. And they just ignore what he's been trying to teach them. And I got to tell you, out of the three synoptic gospels, Mark is hardest on the disciples of all three of them. Because in his gospel, until the resurrection, they just don't get what he's trying to teach them. Sometimes that's true of us also. We just don't get. They have been discussing with one another. This idea of who's going to be his most favored disciple. And when they get to a house in Capernaum where they're staying, and he asks them what they've been talking about, yeah, they don't even want to go there. They think, I don't want to be the one to tell him what we've been talking about. Do you want to be the one to tell him what we've been talking about? But he does. He always does. You know, it's, it's almost amazing the way that they continually don't get what he's saying and he never gives up on them. And so they're there in the house and there's this very unhappy silence because he's asked the one question that they didn't want to have to answer. And he looks out the door, and there's kids playing in the street. And he brings one of them in, and he brings them among them, and he picks them up and holds them and says, Look, 
if you're going to be chief in my kingdom, it's got to be like this. You've got to be able to welcome a little child like this and do for him what needs to be done. Because when you receive a child like this in my name, it also comes in the name of the one who has sent me. He says, if you're going to be the greatest, you got to be the servant to the most. And sometimes we forget that. That the call to be a Christian is a call to be a servant. You know, all week long running through my mind has been this verse. It's the last verse of chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Now we all know that chapter, you know, it's the love chapter and all like that. And it, I would hate to think how many of the weddings I've done, we read that chapter. But the truth is, the word that's love in that chapter hadn't got anything about how a man and a woman feel about each other when they get married. If that's a whole different word, it's interesting. Greek has four different words for love. It does. It has eros. That's for the man and the woman to get married. It has storge. That's for parents of their children and children of their parents. It has philos. That's how we, when we feel kindly disposed to our brothers and sisters in the community. And then it has agape. And that's the word that runs all the way through the 13th chapter. It gets to the end. Finally, these three abide, faith, hope, and love. It's faith, hope, and agape, which means the kind of love that you do for others even when they don't deserve it, even when they're not worth it, even when you've got something better than you can, than you can do, you still do things for others. And that's what Jesus is talking about in today's lesson, how we live out this agape love because all through the New Testament, when it's talking about love, Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The world is agape. It, if you look at it in English, it would be a gay. Now think about that. When we're a gay, we're... And he's just telling us that we've got to be servant of all, and we're... His agape makes us be a gay. God calls us through the cross to serve people, to spread the message, to let people know that there is a God who loves them, who wants them, who wants a relationship with them, who wants them to be with him in eternity. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is John 3.17, not 3.16. We all know that one, right? But 3.17 says, For God sent his Son in the world by to condemn the world, but that through him the whole world might be saved. God intends the whole world to be saved. That's the whole purpose of Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the call of Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. We talked about that in confirmation class this morning about the promises that God makes to Abraham are promises for all of us. Because he, said, he tells Abraham, through you I'm going to bless the whole world. And I don't know how many breaks it takes to get from somewhere between 1200 and 2000 B.C. to now, or to 1 A.D., 30 A.D. That's how many breaks it takes to go from Abraham to Jesus, all those greats, grandson. Grandson. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God promises Jesus, born sometime in the early AD years. God plays a long game, God doesn't give up. God continues to come to us. Now, I am not a basket. I have been 
been fishing much since I was a kid, and that was with a cane pole. When I was over at the creek and running down beside feet, catching bread and catfish. But I always kind of think of God as a great eternal bass fisher. That means instead of throwing a plug out to catch fish, he's throwing something out to catch us. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't quit going. He doesn't say, well, they're not fighting today. I guess I'll go home. He stays out in that boat and keeps casting and casting and casting. Hopefully, every day, catching a few of them. God doesn't give up on us. Certainly, we should not give up on God. Now, I'm here to tell you, the world isn't always the place that it should be or could be. But that's not on God. That's on us. But our call as Christians is to work, shape the world to make it a better place than it is. And over time, through history, in general, the world's a better place to live in today than it was a few hundred years ago. And how to keep making I'm not saying we're ever going to get there. But because we don't get there doesn't mean we don't keep the struggling in the journey. God wants us so much. He sends his only son to die on the cross for us. Our lives, our lives, don't have to be lived in vain. That there is a purpose, that there is something for us, that even in death does not go away.